Okay, um, we go to the first page here, and uh, if you write your name at the top, do that every time. Uh, we got some new definitions, namely that uh, a function can be one to one. Okay, one to one. So this is a new definition for you, and I would expect that, like I asked about a definition of a function last time on the test, you could expect that you may see the definition of one to one or the definition of an inverse as well. And so here's one to one. A function is said to be one to one if each element of the domain corresponds or maps to exactly one in the range. Now that's actually the de definition of a function. It's one to one if that is true and exactly one element of the range corresponds to exactly one in the domain. So let me give you an example here. The function y equals x squared. If I draw it, it looks like that. Now I have an element of the range, say 4. What elements of the domain will produce a value of 4 in the range for that? There's two of them. If I have 4 is y, so that's my range value, what values will give me 4 in the domain? 2 and negative 2. So you can see that in this case, a negative 2 produces a spot there, and positive 2 produces a spot there. So therefore, it's not 1 to 1. Because given the value 4, there are two elements in the domain that correspond to it. So it's not 1 to 1. Namely, in order for a function to be 1 to 1, it must pass the vertical line test. That makes it a function. That's what it already says, function. And it also must pass the horizontal line test. Now would then make it one to one. And again, one to one just means that not only every element in domain goes to exactly one in the range, but every one in the range goes to exactly one in the domain. So this one fails to be one to one. However, if I draw this, even though that's curvy and stuff, it does pass the horizontal line test. That would be an example of a function that is one to one. So. If I gave you some graphs, could you determine if they were one-to-one -one by doing the horizontal line test? And the horizontal line test, again, means that, that you just it can't cross it more than once. Okay? Questions? <coughs> nope. Nope. On the green, it would, it would come really close to flattening out and then go back up. So, so good question. Okay, any questions on one-to-one? -one? Going once, twice, thrice. Okay. Well, let's talk about inverses then. If they are one-to-one, -one, then it's easier to work with their inverses. And namely, f of x and f inverse of x are inverses. Note that f negative 1 of x does not equal 1 over f of x. That is, that is not true. All right. It, it doesn't mean I'm taking it to the negative one power. It means I'm inverting the operation. I'm inverting the operation. Here's what f inverse actually means. If I have f of x, it has a given domain. And it has a given range. And if I have f inverse, I have a given domain. And I have a given range. Here's what happens. 
if I plug in a domain of f, I get out of range, right? What's going to happen here is the inverse actually maps to the other one. So the domain of f is the same as the range for f inverse. And the range of f is the same as the domain for f inverse. Now, I know that that sounds confusing, but when we do these next two examples, you're going to understand it completely. Again, the domain of f is actually the range of the inverse, and the range of f is the domain of the inverse. Uh, we'll get to the test to see if they're inverses in a second. Graphically, they are reflected over the line y equals x. So your inverses actually get reflected over a line graphically, and we're going to use that to check. Let's do a couple examples here so you guys can start to understand uh, the heart of the matter. These are all f negative 1. Does that read right on your paper, f negative 1? Just as positive 1? Should be f negative 1 for all those. So I apologize if, if it didn't show up. Okay. So, so it's probably hard to read. Okay, I, I apologize for that. So these should all read uh, f, you know, negative 1, f negative 1. So what that's saying is f inverse of 8. Well, look, it says given f of 2 is 3, f of 1 is 9, f of negative 3 is 8, and f of 4 is 5, and f is 1 to 1, find the following. So I want to know f inverse of 8. How do you know that? Yeah. So what Parker realizes here is uh, f inverse of 8 means 8 in the range of f will give us negative 3 in the domain. So it kind of undoes what happened before. Again, the, the inverse will produce the domain of the original function. So how about f inverse of 3? Right, I look at that one. f inverse of 3 will give me 2. The range produces the domain. How about f of f inverse of 5? I would get 4. And f inverse of 9, I would get 1. So if I gave you two problems on a test, one be identify if it's one-to-one -one by using horizontal line tests, and number two, I'll do a problem like example one. You guys could do those pretty easy, right? Let's get something slightly more difficult, okay? Come on in. Sure. You want a sheet of paper? Let's actually find the inverses, okay? And here's how we find the inverses. Switch x and y and solve for y. So if the domain and the range is switched, I could just switch x and y, and that will give me the inverse. So this reads y equals 2x minus 5. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch them. x equals 2y minus 5, and now I'll solve for y. How do you solve for y? Add 5, so x plus 5 is equal to 2y, divide by 2, and I get y is equal to x plus 5 over 2. If you would like to write that as y equals 1 half x plus 5 halves, that's fine as well. But either one of those represents the inverse of the original function. Yeah? Let's try it on our calculator. We said that inverses should be reflected over the line y equals x if, in fact, they are inverses of each other. So let's go to our calculator. I got something goofy in there. Uh, and we'll type in our two functions. We'll type in 2x minus 5. And then below that, we're going to type in 0.5x plus 2.5.
And then for my third one, I'm going to graph the line y equals x. I'm going to make it bold so we can see that hopefully those two lines should be reflected over each other. Give you a second to get caught up here. And remember, um, when I go to graph, I, I graph by just pressing zoom 6 or zoom standard. That way we all see the same viewing window. So here I go, zoom 6 for a standard viewing window. Uh, that's my first line. That's my second line. And there's my line y equals x. So can you tell if I take this bottom function and I were to flip it over this line y equals x, I would get that, wouldn't I? Notice this. Look at this. What's the uh, what's the y-intercept here? Negative 5. That becomes the x-intercept for the other one. You know, the domain and range values flip. So the y-intercept to this one is uh, is like, what, 2.5? And that happens to be the x-intercept to the other one. So, I mean, they, they really do flip. So that's a way to check to see if you did it correctly. Let's try one that's harder. f of x equals 2 minus x over 3x minus 4. I saw Amanda back there saying, this is too easy, Mr. Gens. Give me something that challenges me because I'm sick and tired of this boring stuff. So <laughs> what's my first step? What do I do first? I switch them. So my new equation is x equals 2 minus y over 3y minus 4. I like it. What do I have to solve for? That means y needs to be in the numerator and by itself. Uh, it's not in the numerator right now. So I'll pull a little trick here. We'll go over 1. What should I do? Cross multiply. Very good. So I, I come up with a new expression. 2 minus y is equal to 3xy minus 4x. Got to solve for y. Do you remember doing this at the beginning of the year? We had to solve for a variable. The idea is we collect all the terms on one side that have a y, and then we'll factor it out. So which side would you like to put y on? We'll put it over on the right side. So I'll add 4x, and I'll add a y to each side, and I get 2 plus 4x is equal to 3xy plus y. Now what? Factor out the y. So I get 2 plus 4x equals y times 3x plus 1. Beautiful. Now what? Divide off the 3x plus the 1. And you get y is equal to 2 plus 4x over 3x minus 1. That is, in fact, the inverse. What? Yeah. Caught me. How do you like them apples? Got it? So that would be the harder one that I would ask you guys to try to do where you solve for, for y in that nature. Any questions about that? Okay. Let's flip it over. F of x equals 2 minus 3x to the third. Need to find the inverse of that. That's y equals 2 minus 3x to the third. If I switch the values, I get x equals 2 minus 3y to the third. I want to solve for y. What do I do? Minus the 2. x minus 2 equals negative 3y to the third. Now what? Divide by negative 3. y to the third is equal to x minus 2 over negative 3. Now what? Cube root. Can I take the cube root of negatives? Yes. Take the cube root of anything. So we have no issues doing that. Uh, so I get y is equal to the cube root of x minus 2 over negative 3. So I don't have to be 
I don't have to worry about the domain of that. It, it could be negative numbers or positive numbers. I'm good to go. Question. I don't think so. I'd have to look at it. What was your first step? Three Y equals when you divide by three and then cubed root it. So you got Y is the cubed root of two minus X over positive three. Yeah, no, that's correct because that's just with a factor. Of, uh, you, so it basically it's a negative one factored out. So that, that works out. Absolutely fine. Okay. All right, let's try uh, one more. This one's just slightly more challenging, not as intuitive. You're going to learn something new. 4 plus the square root of x plus 1. We switch the x and the y values, and we get x is equal to 4 plus the square root of y plus 1. So what should I do? x minus 4 equals the square root of y plus 1. Now what? Square both sides. So that I get Where did I get the minus 8x? Yeah, I got to foil that out. So x minus 4 times x minus 4, I get a negative 8x in the middle. Negative 4 times negative 4 is positive 16 uh, equals y plus 1. And uh, what should I do now? Minus the 1. So in the end, you get y is equal to x squared minus 8x plus 15. Now, Uh, so now you want to factor it. Don't need to factor it. It's fine like it is. Nothing wrong with it. But you're right. This does factor x minus 3, x minus 5. We don't need to do that. We, we have an inverse. But there's a problem here. What's the graph look like? Parabola. Does that pass the horizontal line test? No. So we've created something. Watch what happens here. A square root function like this just has one half of the parabola, right? When I squared it, I created the other half of the parabola. Pull out your calculators and you'll see what I mean. So I'll leave my line y equals x there. I'm going to type in 4 plus the square root of x plus 1. And then below that, x squared minus 8x plus 15. When I graph this, watch what happens. That's my square root function. That's my parabola. That's my line. Look. If I took this piece right over here, this part of the square root function, and flipped it over, it would be right down there. If I took this square root function and flipped it over, I would get this part, the right-hand part of the graph. But I created that left-hand part of the graph when I squared both sides. So that's a problem. All I have to do is limit my domain by saying I don't want to talk about everything to the left. I just want to talk about the stuff to the right. But to the right of what point? What point do I need to focus on here? The vertex. I need to focus on the x value of the vertex. So I want to limit the graph to be everything to the right of the x value of the vertex. How do I compute the x value of the vertex? Negative b divided by 2a. Very good. So I have negative negative 8 or positive 8 divided by 2 is 4. So in other words, I'm only talking about x values greater than or equal to 4. So if you do produce something that is not 1 to 1, 
then you need to account for that by restricting the domain to be something that is, uh, you know, workable. Does that make sense? That's one of the more challenging pieces that you would see. Okay. Two more problems. We're not going to do all four. We're just going to do two. Um, if you go back to your first page, the last thing we want to do is test to see if something's an inverse. Here's how you test to see if something's an inverse. You make a composition function. If I do f of f inverse of x, I should get x. That's not enough, though. you got to test the other way around. You also have to do f inverse of f of x, and that should also produce x. If you can create two composition functions and have them work out to where they both get x, then we've done our job. So, let's try it. It says, use the property of inverses to determine if f and g are inverses of each other. So, what I need to do is I need to make a composition here. This is suggesting that f and g might be inverses. Let's check. I need to do f of g of x. If I want to do f of g of x, what will I do? I take that x plus 5 over 3, and I plug it in for x right there. And so I get this. 3 over 1 times x plus 5 over 3 minus 5. Well, what's the 3 times the x plus 5 over 3? What happens to the 3s? They cancel each other out, so you're left with x plus 5 minus 5 is equal to just x. So, it looked like it worked for that portion, but that's not enough. I need to check the other composition the other way around. I need to check g of f of x. How do I do that? Yep, I plug that right in there. So I get 3x minus 5 plus 5 divided by 3, which is 3x over 3, which is x. So I have shown that if I do both compositions, I do arrive at x, and that shows that they are 1 to 1. Let me connect your learning real quick so you can understand where this is all coming from. Look what happened here on our first page. Okay? Look what happened. These are one to one. We said f of 2 is 3. So if you take an x value 2 and you plug it in and get 3, and then plug it into the inverse, what do you arrive back at? Your original x our original x. So that's what this is doing. We're carrying out this process. We're just not using numbers. Plug in an x, get a y. Plug in the y, get your original x. And that's exactly what's happening uh, right here. We get our original x. Okay? Let's try here. One more problem. Again, I need to test to see if they are inverses. So I plug I'm going to do f of g of x first. So I'm going to take this g of x, and I'm going to plug it in right there. What would that look like? That looks kind of funny. What do you think? One over one over x minus two plus two, right? So I took this 1 over x minus 2 and just plugged that in for x. So that's right here. And I have, I have the plus 2 on the end. Well, actually, that doesn't look too bad now. The minus 2 and the plus 2 go away. I'm left with 1 over 1 over x. If that confuses you, 1 over 1 over x, write it as a complex fraction, where you have a fraction on top and the bottom. Or 1 over 1 over 1 over x. 
If I have a fraction divided by a fraction, what do I do? Multiply by the reciprocal. So we'll multiply by the reciprocal, which is x over 1, and we get x. So that worked out. We'll try one more method. We have to do g of f of x. When I do that, how do I do that? Take this f of x value, and I plug it in right there. So I have, let's see, 1 over 1 over x plus 2 minus 2, right? Well, look, look what we got. We got 1 over 1 over x plus 2, which is kind of like what we had over here, right? So if we multiply by the reciprocal, what are we going to have here? Yeah, we'd have x plus 2 minus 2. What happens? 2's cancel. We left with 0. I'm sorry, x. There you go. So we've shown that both result in the value of x, which is exactly what we want. Um, so we're good to go. Any questions? This is the last of the content that we want to study before our test. Let me shut this off.